First, let's look at the anatomy of the quadriceps. As the name implies, the quadriceps is a group of four individual muscles. Three of these muscles we can call the vastus muscles. These are the vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, and vastus medialis. These three vastus muscles all insert at the quadriceps tendon, which attaches to the kneecap. They all originate at different points on the femur, which is the thigh bone. The fourth quad muscle is the rectus femoris. This is the large quad muscle running down the middle of the thigh, sitting on top of the vastus muscles. This also inserts at the quadriceps tendon, like the other quad muscles. However, the rec fem originates from a point on the pelvis, not the femur. This has implications for its function and how it is best trained, which we will cover throughout this video. We also have another muscle in this region, which is the sartorius muscle. It is not considered one of the quadriceps muscles, but it has similar functions, so it might as well be one of them. This is a long and thin muscle which inserts on the inside of the tibia, or shin bone, just below the knee. And it originates from the pelvis like the rectus femoris. We aren't going to discuss how to train the sartorius for the remainder of this video, since it will likely get trained indirectly when targeting the other quad muscles. It is also worth mentioning something about the quadriceps tendon that all the quad muscles attach to. This tendon attaches to the patella or kneecap. This then extends past the kneecap where the name changes to the patella tendon. The patella tendon then attaches onto the tibia or shin bone. So essentially, we can think of the quadriceps muscles as being extended to attach onto the tibia, which is how it contributes to moving the knee joint. And on that note, let's now discuss what functions the quadriceps muscles contribute to. Well, the main function of the quad muscles is to extend the knee. This is the movement of kicking the knee out to straighten the leg. All four quad muscles perform knee extension, and this is the only role of the three vastus muscles. And the other lesser function of the quads is to flex the hip. This is the movement of bringing the leg up towards the chest. Only the rectus femoris performs this action, since it is the only quad muscle which attaches onto the pelvis. This also brings up a relevant point, which is the biarticular muscle theory. A biarticular muscle is one which acts on two or more joints. In this case, the rectus femoris acts on both the knee and hip, contributing to knee extension as well as hip flexion. This is relevant when performing any squat-based exercise, where it involves simultaneous knee extension and hip extension. In this case, as we stand up from a squat, the rectus femoris will be lengthening at the hip joint, but shortening at the knee joint. So the rectus femoris likely won't maximally contribute to the movement, since two opposing joint actions are being performed at the same time. Because of this, squats may not be the best exercise to train the rectus femoris. Although it should be noted that this doesn't apply to the vastus muscles since they only act on the knee joint and aren't influenced by hip position. With that in mind, let's now discuss what exercises are effective to train the quads. There are two main categories of exercises which will effectively train the quads. First are squats or any other squat pattern. This includes the classic barbell squat, but also extends to leg presses, lunges, split squats, hack squats, belt squats, pendulum squats, and so on. They all essentially involve the same actions, simultaneous knee and hip extension. And the other exercise category is leg extensions. There aren't as many leg extension variants, with the main one being the classic leg extension machine. But this category can also include standing leg extensions, reverse Nordics, and strict sissy squats. Both exercise categories are going to train the quadriceps well, but they aren't necessarily completely interchangeable. Firstly, squats are going to train other muscles in addition to the quads. Namely, the glute max and adductors are going to heavily contribute to squats too. This was seen in this study, which found that squat training resulted in significant increases in glute max and adductor cross-sectional area in addition to the quadriceps after squat training. Secondarily, depending on the specific squat variant, we may also get a little indirect work from stabilizer muscles of the torso. For example, during a barbell back squat, the spinal erectors, abdominals, and upper traps are all going to be working isometrically to hold the torso in a rigid and stable position while the legs perform the movement. Whereas leg extensions pretty much just isolate the quads. 
there aren't any other muscles which significantly contribute to leg extensions as a prime mover, and they also don't involve accessory and stabilizer muscles to any significant magnitude. And the other difference between squats and leg extensions is for the specific quad muscles that are emphasized. We find that both exercise categories train the vastus muscles to a similar magnitude, and this makes sense, since the vastus muscles all perform knee extension only, and both exercises require knee extension. However, the rectus femoris will likely experience superior growth from leg extensions compared with squats. This is due to the biarticular nature of the rectus femoris, as previously discussed. As discussed, the rectus femoris shortens at the knee, but lengthens at the hip, meaning that it can't really contribute maximally to the lift. Whereas the hips don't move at all during leg extensions, so the rec fem can maximally contribute to knee extension. This theory was confirmed by this study, which compared the effects of Smith machine squats versus leg extensions on quadriceps hypertrophy. It was found that the vastus lateralis saw similar increases in cross-sectional area from both exercises. However, the rectus femoris experienced substantially greater gains from the leg extensions. Next, let's move on to some unique setup and technique recommendations to help us maximally stimulate the quads during each exercise. There are a few considerations for both squats and leg extensions that we will cover. First, let's look at how to maximize quad growth during squat variants. There are two primary technique considerations for squats. The first consideration is for squat depth. Generally, we find that training through a larger range of motion is beneficial for hypertrophy. This is likely because full range of motion training usually takes the muscles into a greater stretch. In this case, squatting deeper would take the quads into a greater stretch compared with partial depth squats. So it would be assumed that squatting deeper would result in superior quadriceps growth, right? Well, we have two studies I am aware of which compare the effects of different depths during squat variants on quad hypertrophy. The first one compared the effects of squatting to 90 versus 140 degrees of knee flexion on lower body muscle growth. It was found that the full depth squats resulted in greater increases in cross-sectional area of the adductors and glute max, as we would expect. However, the quadriceps experienced similar gains after both squat depths, despite being taken through a larger range of motion during the deep squats. The other study compared the effects of performing leg press training to either partial depth of 100 degrees knee flexion or full range, as low as they could possibly go. It was found that increases in quadriceps muscle thickness were similar after both conditions, despite the deep leg press training taking the quads through a larger stretch. So, from the evidence we have, it seems that deep squats benefit the other muscles contributing to the squat, but don't seem to influence quad hypertrophy to a meaningful degree. However, I would still personally recommend deep squats for two primary reasons. First is that, while we only have two direct studies comparing this, the overall body of evidence suggests that training through a larger range of motion is usually beneficial for hypertrophy. So, with more evidence, we may find a significant benefit on the quads. And second is that, even if muscle growth isn't significantly greater, the load we are able to use is significantly less with deep squats. This is going to limit overall joint stress and axial loading on the spine, making it less globally fatiguing without compromising hypertrophy. So, I'd recommend squatting as deep as you can while maintaining control and a rigid torso position. Try to squat to the point where your thighs are at least parallel to the ground. And if you can go lower than this, it might be slightly better. And the other technique consideration is the stance and torso angle we squat with. We can squat in different ways, such as with a wide stance, forward leaning position, or a narrow stance, upright position. Unfortunately, we don't have any direct evidence I am aware of which compares quad hypertrophy between different stance widths or torso angles. So we can't be too confident in how much magnitude of difference our stance and torso angle will actually make. But hypothetically, if we reach the same amount of knee flexion, the involvement of the quads should be fairly similar and result in a similar hypertrophic stimulus. However, these different techniques may influence the involvement of other muscles. Squatting with more of a forward lean increases the moment arm from the barbell to the hip joint. This increases the demands on the hip extensors, the glutes in this case, meaning they will probably be worked harder compared with an upright torso position. 
whereas a more upright torso position will increase the moment arm from the barbell to the knee joint. This essentially just makes the movement more challenging on the quadriceps as we aren't able to involve the hips as much. Due to these mechanical differences, a more upright torso may increase the likelihood of the quads being the muscle which fails first, and therefore be the primary muscle that is trained. This would essentially make the squat a little more isolated as a quad exercise. Whereas a forward lean might result in the glutes to be also trained to a similar proximity to failure to that of the quads, meaning the glutes would achieve a similar magnitude of muscle growth resulting in a greater global stimulus from the squat. In practice, this means something like a hack squat or a heel elevated smith machine squat may be a little more quad dominant, whereas something like a low bar squat or a forward leaning split squat may be a little more glute dominant. So the technique we train with can be adjusted based on which muscles you want to emphasize. But again, this is speculative since we don't have any direct evidence investigating actual hypertrophy outcomes with these technique differences. Next, let's move on to some setup and technique considerations for leg extensions. There are two unique exercise setup considerations for leg extensions. The first is for the range of motion we train with. Unlike squats, we have pretty clear evidence that taking the quads into a greater stretch via a larger range of motion during leg extensions results in superior quadriceps hypertrophy. For example, this study compared the effects of performing leg extensions with either partial range of motion in the lengthened position, partial range of motion in the shortened position, full range of motion, or alternating between the lengthened and shortened partial ranges. It was found that all groups which included the lengthened range of the exercise saw greater increases in quadriceps cross-sectional area compared with the shortened partials. However, the issue with leg extensions is that the maximum range of motion we are able to achieve is predetermined by the machine. The machine stops at some point and we aren't able to go any further down, even if it would be beneficial to do so. In this case, we just want to make sure we are going all the way to the end range where the movement naturally stops. If your leg extension machine is adjustable, I'd recommend setting it to the maximum range where you are able to achieve the greatest amount of knee flexion. Furthermore, another way to increase its range is to add a yoga mat or strap a yoga block to the foot pad which will increase the amount of knee flexion we achieve. And the other exercise setup consideration for leg extensions is our torso angle. As discussed, our hip angle influences the length of the rectus femoris. So leaning further back during a leg extension will stretch the rec fem more while being more upright will shorten it. Because of this, leaning back seems to be a little more effective for rec fem hypertrophy. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of performing leg extensions with the hips at either a standard 90 degree angle or leaning back so the hips are at a 40 degree angle. It was found that the vastus lateralis saw similar increases in muscle thickness after each condition, as expected. However, the rectus femoris saw greater gains when the leg was leaning back, which is likely because it is trained in a more stretched position when we are leaning back. So if it is possible, we may want to angle the backrest of the leg extension machine further back to maximize rec fem hypertrophy. Although this may or may not be possible depending on the specific machine you have available. Alternatively, something like a standing leg extension with a cable will also achieve the same thing since the hips are extended. And lastly, let's move on to some unique programming considerations for quad training. There are two primary programming considerations I can think of relevant for quad training. The first consideration is for exercise selection. More specifically, should you prioritize squat patterns or leg extensions in your training program? Well, I'd say this depends on your goals. If you want to achieve the most total muscle growth with a single exercise, then squats are going to be more effective. This is because they train other muscles like the glutes and adductors and involve stabilizer muscles to brace the trunk. But if you want to completely isolate the quads, then leg extensions are going to be a better option. Leg extensions are also going to train the rectus femoris better than squats, so for maximal quad development, it may be necessary to include leg extensions in your training program in some capacity. There is also the concern for fatigue. Squats are almost always going to be more globally fatiguing than leg extensions. They require greater stability demands, greater axial loading, higher cardiorespiratory fatigue, require greater psychological readiness, more technical to perform, and feel overall more effortful than leg extensions. 
So if you just want to get a good stimulus with less effort and fatigue, then leg extensions may be a better option. But if time and mental effort aren't a concern, then squats can be a valid option. Another programming consideration is for exercise order. Generally, we would want to perform compound free weight lifts before isolation lifts. So in this case, we would want to perform squats earlier in a workout and leg extensions later in a workout if they are going to be performed in the same training session. Although it might be valid in some cases to perform leg extensions before squats. This can be a strategy to pre-fatigue the quads before squats. This will limit how much load or how many reps we can perform for the subsequent squat pattern. Of course, this is not recommended if you want to maximize strength development. However, as long as we are still training close to failure, it doesn't seem to be all that influential on hypertrophy. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of performing leg press training in either a fresh state or immediately after a set of leg extensions to failure. As expected, total volume load was significantly lower in the pre-fatigue condition. However, increases in quadriceps muscle thickness after 9 weeks was similar between conditions despite the inhibited lifting performance. So this can be a viable programming strategy for those who want to limit axial loading and overall joint stress from squat training. This might be used by those who are training around injury, have a history of joint pain, or those who are very strong squatters and simply want to limit loading to minimize long-term joint stress. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.